Hey there, how you going? I just wanted to say before I got stuck into this episode, thank you. Thank you so much. I've been chatting with some of you on DMs. I've received ratings and reviews and just lots of awesome feedback about what you like, about what you don't, <laughs> and you know how to move forward and how to continue to give you fun and inspirational and exciting and different ways of thinking about your wedding. And it absolutely energizes me and keep it coming because you feed back this info to me. I make better shows for you. That's the deal. So let's talk about these bloody wedding traditions. While there are countless permeations of the different history, meanings, traditions, superstitions, um, cultural influences and religions that you may want to consider and include in your wedding planning and your day of activities, the number one thing that I implore for all of my couples and you to consider is, what does this mean for us? Long-standing customs that are followed and passed down from family to family can be a beautiful and sentimental connection to your foundations, history, and identity. And there is seriously much to be said for including meaningful and connection-filled rituals and moments of pause in your wedding. The continuation of these practices, they offer a chance to feel a part of something bigger and they give you a place. You belong. But what I want to address in this episode is the stuff that you feel you have to do. It feels heavy. You procrastinate about it. It can sometimes feel painful, a waste of your time and money, or perhaps, most importantly, it doesn't reflect your values. Today, I'm going to share six outdated wedding traditions that don't make sense in 2023 and a few ideas for how to give them a bit of a glow up. So while this is a little tongue in cheek, I'm also deadly serious when I say please don't feel pressured into adding any rituals or traditions to your wedding if they don't mean anything to you. Examine why you're doing them and the time and money they'll take too and make your own way together. Maybe you can start a beautiful and meaningful new tradition that you'll be proud to have your family pass down in the future. Let's get into it. Unbridely is a community of pro-wedding vendors who believe in freedom and integrity in weddings, giving you options, solutions, tips and tricks to create the experience and memories that you and your fiancé really want and deserve. Because we believe that weddings are a team sport. With how-tos, stories and interviews with recently married couples, we find out what went right and what they'd change if they could go back and do it all over again. I'm Camille and welcome to the Unbridly podcast. Okay, no mucking around. The number one outdated wedding tradition that doesn't make sense anymore is that it's bad luck to see each other before your ceremony. This superstition and practice goes way back to times of arranged marriages, when the couple getting married often hadn't even met face-to-face yet, the thinking being that if they saw each other before they were joined in marriage, that it was an opportunity for one of them to bail out before the wedding due to the other's appearance. Bad news for the parents trying to set them up, for sure, but not bad luck as such. Over the years, this tradition has also been associated with the thought of enhancing that moment when the person waiting at the ceremony space, like at the altar, gets to see their fiancé all dressed up for the very first time as they walk in during the processional or wedding entrance song. I've heard so many brides in particular say that they don't want their future spouse to see them until that moment, and then (laughs) that they'd better cry or else. And I absolutely get that. No one will be able to change your mind on it either. In all things, this choice is yours and yours alone. But I'd like you to at least consider that. It's not bad luck to see each other before your ceremony. So ditch that antiquated way of thinking. It won't serve you. But also, if your wedding is a one-day event, as most are, you've only got around 18 hours to squeeze everything in. 
If your ceremony is at 3 p.m., for example, you'll only be spending about nine hours of your wedding day with your future husband, wife, or spouse. That's a measly half of the time that you could have if you got ready at the same place together. I urge you to at least think about making better use of the time on your wedding day and your photographer's time too. One option might be to have a first touch, first prayer, or sharing of a card or letter with each other, but without seeing each other. So you could choreograph this like around a corner and have your crew on one side, their crew on the other side, helping you to exchange this touch or prayer or letter or card, something like that. This can really help ease your nerves if you're dead set against seeing each other before that moment at the altar. For my husband and I, there was never really any thought of getting ready separately. We already had our daughter and we all wanted to be together. So we got ready in the same hotel room at the venue where we held our ceremony and reception at, because again, we didn't want to waste precious time. We had pre-wedding photos so we could spend more time with our guests rather than running off after our ceremony to have the photos. And we had our family stay in the same hotel too, so we could share a recovery breakfast with them the very next day. My big message on this one is just don't let dumb superstition rob you of precious time and memories on your wedding day. Number two is that you must have a bridal party. Of course, before marriage equality, your bridesmaids and groomsmen were referred to as bridal parties the bride and bridegroom's attendance, if you like. But these days, we're much more conscious of the fact that not all attendants in a wedding are bridesmaids or groomsmen, and not all wedding parties can be referred to as bridal as such. So I'll always try to refer to these people as wedding parties. The history of wedding parties stretches way back, and in episode 20, six essential questions to ask yourself before you pick your bridesmaids, I go through some of the past reasons that couples had bridesmaids and groomsmen, including, but not limited to, being great swordsmen, holding the dowry, uh, helping to stop the bride from escaping, because you had to have 10 witnesses at a ceremony, being servants, being older and already married so the bride always looked better by comparison, and confusing evil spirits who may try to disrupt the wedding. In this day and age, it's laughable. But strangely, we still adhere to the idea that a couple should have some sort of attendance on their wedding day. Your closest and best standing next to you at the ceremony, and some are also expected to assist in the planning and paying of several pre-wedding events like the engagement party, bridal shower, kitchen tea, bachelorette, hen's night, hen's weekend, all of that. And I ask you, who really wants to be played off against other family members or friends For top ranking? Who, if they are particularly close to you, wants to play an accepted and encouraged social hierarchy game of selection for the privilege of paying for an uncomfortable outfit and being someone's unpaid assistant? It's incredibly outdated, and in my personal opinion, borderline ridiculous that your nearest family and friends, who would nine times out of ten be required to stand next to you during the ceremony as well, don't get to really see or enjoy your ceremony either. We can also wrap up into this tradition the idea that you can only have single sex members in your wedding party. Engaged couples today needn't let 100 year old gender roles get in the way of celebrating and honouring those they feel closest to. And matching bridesmaids' dresses can go in here as well. While I go into this deeper in episode 20, the idea was. In Roman times, bridesmaids wore the same gown as the bride to confuse evil spirits who might try to crash the festivities and bring bad luck. And then, when kidnapping became a thing, they would dress the same to act as decoys. Nice, huh? All the feminists who feel creeped out right now, please raise your hand. The same dress style in the same colour needn't be a thing anymore, and I really don't think it adds a whole lot to your enjoyment of your wedding day to have your family and friends conform to your likes and standards, possibly spending money they don't have for an outfit they'd never choose for themselves in a million years and feeling super uncomfortable in the process. Have your wedding party be with you during the special moments on your day. Maybe 
invite them over when you're getting ready or invite them to come to the dress fitting appointment and honor their relationship with you for sure. But please think twice about making them pay in time, money, and energy for the privilege of being seen as your dream team. Let's face facts. You've always been the planner and the organizer, and your fiancé's eyes glaze over a little when you start talking about the details of your wedding day. But you really need someone to share this all with, to bounce ideas off, and someone who's not going to ruin the surprises, but also be supportive and maybe even offer a different perspective. So when you're needing to get a second opinion about your bridesmaid, your in-laws, or your first dance song, Unbridly Couples is your safe space. Unbridly hosts a private Facebook community where modern engaged couples can share ideas, chat, and solve problems, and generally just get freaking excited about their wedding. We also have a curated list of experienced wedding vendor professionals in there to offer suggestions and tips, insight into how to get the most out of your big day. But with no unsolicited DMs or pushy sales tactics, it's just not what Unbridly is about. So you can search for the Unbridly Couples Group on Facebook or just click on the link in the show notes. I'll see you in there. Number three is wearing a veil. This one has customs that trace back to ancient Rome and medieval times. There was the whole hide her face in case she's hideous and he runs situation that I mentioned earlier. But also the Romans believed that evil spirits would bring bad luck on the bride and a veil would, in effect, protect her. It's not exactly a Mandalorian helmet, but a little lace and chul should do it, right? If you like the look of a veil, wear a fucking veil. It'll probably be the only time you ever will. But for the love of all things chocolate, don't let anyone tell you that it's more bridal or that you really should. Tell them to fuck off. Number four, the bride's family must take on all of the costs of the wedding. I mean, first of all, at some weddings there are no brides, but anyway. This tradition states that the bride's family should assume the majority of the costs of her wedding because the purpose of marriage, before females were permitted to be anything other than wives and mothers, was to set young women up for life. Because the transfer of ownership of the bride with the dowry, yes, the bride was seen as property of the family she was born into before she was married, was meant to offset the groom's family's costs of keeping the woman for the rest of her life. The bride's family would pay whatever it took and often more than they could comfortably afford to ensure that the groom's family treated her well and also that the families were seen to be prosperous and worthy. Fast forward to now and in Western cultures, it's rare to have a situation where a bride's family needs to set her up for life, choose her husband or compensate another family to look after her. We look after ourselves, thank you very much. Women are now permitted, and yes, it makes me vomit a little in my mouth when I say that, to be independent, to study, to work, to travel, and to make lives all of their very own. So the entitlement with which some engaged couples talk about their families footing the bill for their wedding, to me, seems super outdated and quite simply misses the point. If you choose to get married because you want, and then you choose to celebrate your marriage with a wedding, again, because you want to, then newsflash, you've signed on to cover the costs too. This doesn't mean that financial in-kind or emotional contributions aren't welcome. Oh my lordy lordy, they are super welcome. But to expect it and then be salty because others don't share your enthusiasm for working their fingers to the bone to ensure you've got crystal glassware is pretty gross. Have the wedding you can afford. Number five, bride on the left, groom on the right. Again, there's sometimes no bride in a wedding, so shock horror, what will we do then and will someone please think of the children? I reckon 
the number one question I get asked at the ceremony rehearsal is, what side do we have to stand on? Followed closely by, what sides do our families sit on? Again, it made sense in medieval times, but not so much today. Traditionally, the bride would stand to the left and the groom to the right as the guests are facing them in the church. The idea was that, as everyone was right-handed, poor lefties were smacked out of it way back then, that the groom would have his right hand free to grab his sword to protect his bride from looters, kidnappers, etc. Pretty rough and ready times back then. So if that's something you're concerned about, by all means, stick to the bride on the left, groom on the right tradition. However, if you part your hair a certain way, or you plan to have a fancy blingy hair clip on one side of your wedding hairstyle, or if you have something asymmetrical on your outfit that you want facing your guests and or your photographer, or if you have a tattoo that you want facing your guests or not, or if you have a better side, or if facing one way or the other means that you're facing the sun, and this is another point for an all-shaded ceremony spot wherever possible, you might just want to do what works for you and what makes you feel comfortable. The other caveat I can think of is if the fiancé who's waiting for you down the end of the aisle has a better view from one side as opposed to the other, you might want to swap it around for that as well. I recently married a couple and the groom and his groomsmen were all close to seven foot tall. So I put them on the side of the ceremony space that sloped away from the location, thus slightly reducing the height difference between the groomsmen and the bridesmaids. So that might be a consideration as well. And when it comes to where your family sit, it doesn't really matter. But they greatly appreciate it if they can see everything clearly and are comfortable, especially your more mature guests, those who are heavily pregnant or have other health needs. Lately, I've been loving having the family seated diagonally opposite their children. So when the couple turn to hold hands and say vows, you know, they're facing each other, their families can still see their faces and expressions more easily. And I've also loved encouraging my couples to think about their wedding party. Do they really want them standing up the front with them for the entire ceremony? Or is there a point where they can sit and watch and enjoy the ceremony themselves? It's something worth thinking about. And number six in outdated traditions is tossing the garter. The Dark Ages were a wild time. The garter toss first came about because it was thought that if a guest could tear off a piece of the newlyweds' clothing as they left at the end of the celebrations, that that piece of clothing, that little piece of material, was good luck. Family and friends would escort the couple to their bedroom and then the ripping would begin. After a while, it was thought that the bride would sometimes toss her garter, like as a deterrent, or have it loosely pinned to the hem of her dress to ward off her enthusiastic guests. The bridal garter was also seen as proof of the consummation of marriage, with the groom presenting the garter to family and friends following their first night together as a married couple. Ew. <laughs> In the 1800s, the race for the garter started to become a thing, and single groomsmen would race from the church to the bridal home, and the bride would toss her garter to them as the winner. This was then thought to evolve to the groom tossing the garter to his groomsmen, and some <laughs> actually pinning it to their hat for good luck. And now generally, the custom is that during the reception, the single men will be called to the dance floor where the groom will retrieve an ornamental garter by his hands or sometimes his teeth and then toss it to the crowd where it's thought that the lucky guy who is going to be the next to be married, will catch it. So if you want to do this, you think it's a fun tradition, it's great for a laugh, crowd participation, then please go for it. Dial up an appropriate tune and have fun. Or if the sexual overtones make the tradition of the removal of the garter icky to you, you could skip the removal part and just put the garter in a balloon that's hidden amongst a few dozen others with material or lace inside for a balloon drop on the dance floor or even wrap it around a football and kick it outside and see who catches it. If you want to throw something else instead for the fun of it, 
stuffed toys like a dog or a cat to all of your guests. So you're not singling out the single people or males or females or anything like that. It might be to all of your guests. A stuffed toy like a dog or a cat might mean who's going to be the next to get a pet. But if it just doesn't work for you, you're put off by the history or simply don't see the appeal of Nana watching on as your future spouse's head is in your yum yum, then just leave it out. Forget about it. No one will really miss it. And you can get on to doing the things that really float your boat. So just to recap the six outdated traditions that really don't make sense anymore are number one, that it's bad luck to see each other before your ceremony. Number two, that you must have a bridal party and they've got to be dressed the same and they've got to be female bridesmaids, male groomsmen. Number three, that you should wear a veil. Number four, the bride's family needs to take on all the costs of the wedding. Number five, bride on the left, groom on the right. And number six, tossing the garter. I hope the discussion and a little bit about the history of these six outdated traditions really gets your mind ticking and thinking and wondering how you can make your wedding even more your own by ditching the stuff that doesn't matter to you anymore. If you have any experience or any ideas about these six traditions, I'd love to hear from you too. You can DM me at any time on Instagram at Unbridely, or you can send me a 90-second audio message on SpeakPipe. The link is in the show notes, and I'll chat to you next week. That about wraps it up for this episode of the Unbridely podcast. For the links and resources we mentioned, please head to the show notes. And if you love the show, please review and subscribe on the podcast platform you're on now so you don't miss out on a single episode. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, weddings are a team sport. Catch you soon.